so welcome everyone. Um, this year, so we will be having um, a talk about test levels, and we will be also talking about some type of creatures uh, along the way, uh, like doppelgangers. Uh, for this talk, I will do it with uh, Frank, uh, who is a former student of the Paul Sabatier University in Toulouse, and he contributed to Tomahawk and K people. And now, nowadays, he's one of the main contributors on uh, Zenshin, which, as you know, is kind of my pet project, and is a resident software craftsman at uh, KDAB. As for me, I'm Kevin Ottens. I'm also a former student of the Paul Sabatier University, and I keep teaching there part-time. Uh, I've been working for the KD community since 2003, so uh, third of my life. And I got a PhD in Artificial Intelligence in 2007. I'm also a resident software craftsman and a trainer uh, at KDAB. So, as you know, for a few years now, we've been uh, banging the drum of uh, TDD, so test-driven development. But really, when you say that, that's just a label, right? That's like a brand. Uh, we're selling soap or something. Uh, that still asks the question of how you write those tests properly. Um, and there are several challenges uh, with that. One of them, and the main one being really how you insulate parts uh, of your design uh, during the test, and so we need solutions for that. And those solutions, that's what we call test doubles. Um, the name, you have to think about movies, you know, with stunt doubles, where you have one person looking like the real actor who actually takes his place uh, during a stunt, was well, the same here, uh, but that will be um, the double of a class which will take its place during, uh, during a test. There are several types of test doubles which exist, and that's what we are going to explore in this talk. Uh, before that, we'll have a definition which I extracted from Wikipedia uh, on what they are. So, that says, in automated unit testing, it may be necessary to use objects or procedures that look and behave uh, like their release intended counterparts, but are actually simplified versions that reduce the complexity and facilitate the testing. The emphasis is my own in that definition. I think that's really the three main uh, characteristics of test double. They have to look like the original, they have to behave almost like the original, and then it's a question of complexity inside of your test which will guide you into picking one of the different types of test doubles. There's roughly four types of uh, test doubles. It's kind of a continuum, so you can't really categorize them crudely. Uh, on the frontiers, it's kind of uh, fusive, and you get from one to the other type. Um, but that's roughly so: dummies, stubs, mocks, and fakes. Um, and you can solve them on a complexity axis because you generally pick one depending on the level of complexity you have in your test, and they are basically tools to move that complexity outside of your test, inside of the test double. Okay, so it has to match. Uh, much in some way, and so all the question for picking that which amount of complexity I want to move from my test, uh, or which design aspect I want to validate with my, st my test, is that just verifying the state uh, of my code under test, or its behavior. And so in title we've been talking about doppelgangers, so we still have to carry on with that. So what are doppelgangers? In fiction and folklore, a doppelganger is a look-alike or a double of a living person, sometimes portrayed as a paranormal phenomenon. Well, test doubles that's a bit like that, right? They are someone doppel doppelgangers of a living class, instead of being doppelgangers of a living person. And they can be of different types of paranormal phenomenon, depending on the complexity you have to deal with. Okay? So now we are going to see the different categories. Uh, first one being the mis. So that's the simplest form of test double you can have in a test. Anything, that's basically an idea where anything goes, right? You will pass something, it's totally passive and opaque and no one really uses it. Uh, that's more to satisfy some interface. So if we look at our paranormal phenomenon, that would be something like the voodoo doll, right? You have something which is totally passive, you can just pin it, uh, you can torture it, uh, because you can't really torture the original and that won't really have any consequence, right? Well, except if you have some beliefs and so on. Um, so the definition of a dummy that would be this one. Uh, dummies are used when a parameter is needed for the testing method. 
uh, or constructor and so on, but without actually needing to use the parameter. Okay? Maybe when you have your test running, okay, you pass a parameter, but you know that that particular method in that particular case is not going to use it, then you just pass some dummy value uh, instead um, and something which will be opaque and not really react, so passive. Um, that could be a new pointer or, or something equivalent like a dummy identifier because you know it won't be used. So I've been talking quite a bit already and so I will leave the mic to Frank so that he can show you uh, an example of dummy. Okay, so can you hear me well? Yeah, I guess. Okay, so I need the pointer. Okay, so I'm not gonna show Zenshin but you know is a to-do application to keep it simple. Uh, so we're gonna mostly look at code and test code basically, which is always having an explicit name and a structure with a given, which is basically an initialization, when, which is the test, and then which is uh, the test checking, making sure everything went right. Okay, so in order to see the dummy, we're gonna see the should add task because we're managing task in Zenshin. Uh, so we have a given part where we initialize stuff. In the test, we're gonna basically add uh, task here you can see. Just look at the selection I'm doing. Just don't try to reach to read every line. It's not gonna be helpful. So in order to do so, we need to initialize an, an entity. And here you can see we pass a dummy because in order to create a task, we don't need note a note entity. It's totally unrelated and will not be used. It's it will be passive during the test. So instead of passing a real object, what we do here is we create a dummy, as Kevin said, and basically it's a null pointer a Q sharp pointer but initialized as null. So this example is quite trivial and after it, it will be way more, com well, more complex and useful. That's all. So that's uh, our first case. Um, so all dummies, um, they have pros and cons, right? So the good thing about dummies is uh, extremely simple to use, right? As we've seen, well, basically you wrap a pointer, pass it, and we're done. Uh, and you probably already do that without even knowing. Um, and that's a mean for, in your test, you avoid creating a lot of collaborator objects for nothing, right? Because you know they won't be, they won't be used. On the other hand, they just cut dependencies and that's it, right? Uh, they won't help you to enforce anything or any type of checking in your test. Um, and your code under test has to be able to cope with the fact that there is a dummy, right? It has to not die just because you passed uh, a null pointer, so you need to be uh, ready for that. So they won't go everywhere, so that's why we have more complex cases like stubs. Um, and that's because now you're in a case where previously with the dummy, you basically just ignore it, right? You, don't, you just pass it around and that's it. Uh, now you need something that you can beat, okay? That you can beat and which will react uh, always in the same way every time you uh, poke at it, right? So that's a bit like a zombie, right? You can beat the hell out of it and it will always carry on asking for more brains, right? That's the only thing it does. Uh, it's totally predictable in its, uh, in its behavior and that's what we are after here. So stubs are used for providing the tested code with indirect input because very often in your tested code, you will call a method and you pass parameters to that method. Okay, so that's direct input for your code under test. But generally, when you start to have a system, well, some of the input you pass directly and some of the input of the code under test is actually coming from some other collaborator object. Okay, and that would be a stub and that's a way for you to inject values uh, inside of your code under test if that's not a direct parameter uh, of what you're manipulating. Uh, the simplest form of stub is basically you have something which returns always the same value that can be a bit uh, more refined. You could have something which returns value A, then B, then C, always in the same, uh, in the same way, uh, in predictable order. Uh, sometimes they might record B tube, then we get slightly into the mocking territories that we see later on. And they are meant for state checking. Okay, the idea is that you create your uh, object, which will be your code under test, you create your stubs, link everyone together, you manipulate the code under test, and then you check the state of that code, the state of the different stubs, and you declare that was fine or not fine. Okay, to make that a bit more concrete, we'll have another example with Frank. Okay, so, if I got the code. Uh, where's my pointer? Here. 
stuff. Okay, so we're gonna look at this piece of code. So again, just follow the selection, otherwise you're gonna have a headache. Uh, okay, so the Zenshin is using an editor. Basically, when you select a task, you can have the detail of the task, like the title, the description, and some test, some start date, is it done, and everything. Uh, so the editor is basically a widget, and he use a model. So here we're gonna try to test the editor, but we're not gonna use a real model, so we're gonna stub it. That's why you can see here that the editor model is stubbed. Uh, in order to do so, we, what we want is to set it up. So the test is about verifying that the a task which is delegated to someone will display a certain label, well, some text, basically. Uh, so get back to the stub. In the initialization, what we do is we create the stub and we set it up the way we want. So basically, we made the, the task being available. We set up the task that will need to be displayed later. And after, we will um, really do the test by putting, setting up the, the model into the editor. And we want to make sure after that that the, the text is, uh, is displayed. So it's visible here. Oops, sorry. The text is visible here. So well, what we do basically, as Kevin said, is we set up a really predictable uh, object, no, a counterpart of a real object, which is the, edi the editor model stuff. We set it up with this value. We do the write test. Here we pass basically the stub, not the real object. And back there, we make sure that everything went well. And it is, because it's a really simple version of an, anti an existing entity, because you made it predictable. You just set the indirect output Kevin was speaking about, which is the state. That's all. OK. Um, so. All stubs, they will allow us to factor out some of the test logic, and they will help us to make the setup and state checking of our tests more readable in general. That's something here we use our own class for stubs, okay? Uh, that's something you could do by using a mocking tool as well, uh, if you use it partially. Um, but you're basically, I mean, if you turn to a mocking tool instead of making your own class, you're basically trading readability with the code size. Okay? If you use a mocking tool, you have less code to write, you create your stub, but then there's much more setup appearing again, okay? so you kind of lose in readability generally. With your own class, that means that you will have to maintain this uh, stub class if one of your interface changes, for instance, um, but then that's generally way more readable. Another problem you might have with the, uh, with the stubs is the fact that you have no clue how you got to the result. Okay? The only thing we know when we use stub is that we query the code under test to check okay, what's your state now, and we verify that the state we expected. We have no idea how that code under test got to the conclusion of that particular state, which is sometimes what you might need. If that's what you need, then you will not need to turn to your real mocks. Uh, that's when you need something, something which starts to be really more clever. And basically, that's more for behavior. So you want something which will confront you every time you have a wrong behavior. So that's a bit like the Frankenstein creator. Um, it basically will pursue you until the end of the world uh, for you to realize that you behaved wrongly in the past, right? So some, something went wrong uh, in your test. So mocks are used for verifying the indirect output, and not input anymore the indirect output of the tested code. Okay? With the stub, we basically injected value inside of our code under test. With mocks, we are looking at what the code under test is pushing out towards uh, collaborator objects. Okay? So that's different, uh, different direction uh, of the data that we are checking. Um, and so we are checking both the actual value and what got called on the collaborator objects. Okay? Um, and that's why for stubs we don't know how we got to the conclusion, why for mocks we know because we can examine which method got called exactly. Um, know that in the literature there's two types of mocks. There's what's called mocks. That's the one where you define the expectations of the behavior uh, of your code under test before you run the test. And there's files where you set the expectations after the execution of the tested code. Okay. Nowadays, 
um, these distinctions tend to disappear and people just talk about mocks. That's kind of more of a technicality which is not necessarily very relevant nowadays. And because of that, that's clear, clearly for behavior checking. And before you fall asleep, we'll have yet another example with mocks. Okay. I'm going to try to take a bit of time because it's more verbose than we're using a, a framework, which basically you need to understand a little bit before starting. I'm going to grow up as well a little bit. Okay, Okay. so uh, this test is about creating a new item, right, new item into, into Zenshin. In order to do so, we use, well, the only backend of Zenshin is Akonadi. So if you, if you see Akonadi all around, it's normal. Okay, so in order to do so, you look at the one section, what happened, we try to create a task, basically. And in order to do that, we have this whole bunch of initialization I'll go through right after. And after that, there is some checking, like always. Okay. So let's let's have a look at the create at the initialization part. Okay. So the point is to create an item, and in order to do so, we need to initialize the repository with a bunch of objects. And we're not going to pass real object, as we said. We're going to pass mocks because we want to make some more in-depth testing than with the stubs before. So here you can see it's mocking, mocking, and some some pointer we don't care about. Okay, so how do we mock in Zenshin? We use Mokito framework. So basically, let's have a look at the storage mock. Storage mock is basically declared here using, well, some Mokito functions. And right after that, what we can define is how it's gonna be, what the input, you, 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 what the state of, of the mock. So here, what, what, does, what this line is meaning, the one I'm gonna try to select, is when you call uh, the default task collection on the on the mock, which is mocking the interface. Uh, when you call it the, the default task collection function with this parameter, which is void basically, then it returns this, which is something you just prepared right before. So that's you you set up a state here. You do the same with another function, the create item. When you pass with this parameter and this parameter, it's supposed to give back this, which is made before. Like again, everything is faked, everything is mocked. So you just have a, a lot of control against the entity your test is picking with, basically. Okay, so you tell me like, okay, that's like a stub, you just prepare a state. Okay, that's fair enough. So when you arrive here, and you make the, the test, the create task, this is going to call basically all this method we just mock. And the framework, the point of the framework is to catch it and just replace with what you, what you pushed before. So it's gonna be really predictable as a stub and everything is going fine, okay. So now what's the difference with the, with, the, with the stuff we were speaking before is if you look at the Zen section, what we're going to do is we're going to make sure it behaves as we wanted, which means that we want this function. Okay, this one is a server. We are speaking about the storage, so let's keep it consistent. Okay, so we make sure that this function has been called with this parameter exactly one. So we're making sure of the code pass under the test, you know, like how it not only just the result, how it has behaved internally. And same with create item, we make sure that it called with this item exactly and with this collection exactly, exactly one. So that's more in-depth testing. That's why it's more complex and stable and more verbose. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So what's nice with that is that we can completely simulate all the collaborators uh, with our code under test. And that's also a way for us to verify hidden protocols, okay? Because then we start to see protocols appearing between our collaborator objects. And so we make sure that we make a certain number of calls of that particular method uh, behind the scene with that, those particular uh, parameters. So that allows you to really get the code under test in a vacuum, okay? It, it's completely in a, in a simulated environment which pretends to be the real thing. But as we've just seen, it's generally very verbose to set up, right? Because you have to declare every method where you expect a call with a particular value, and, and then you have to do all the checks to say, okay, that's the number of time I was expected to be called with those parameters and so on. Um, the, other big problem there is that it's making refactoring more difficult later on because by doing that, you're coupling uh, your test, the code of your test, with the actual implementation of the class, right? Okay, so you later down the line, you will have more problem, okay? You will be less 
able to react to change because then you have to adjust all the tests just because you have an internal behavior which change, which maybe led you to the same result. Okay, but just it's done differently, then your test will fail. Okay, so sometimes we might be in a situation where mocks or stubs are not enough. Generally, a sign of that, that's when you start to have not one mock in your test, but two mocks, three mocks, four mocks, okay? And then you start to have something like 40 lines of code just to prepare all the states for your mocks and all the checking. Well, basically what you have at that point is you're trying to simulate a subsystem, a complete subsystem and not just a few collaborator objects. So in that case, if you want to simulate a subsystem, you need to create a fake one. Uh, and so that's especially interesting when you have big external dependencies and you wish to cut them for the time, uh, for the time of a test. So you need something almost exactly like the original system, but not quite. So that's where we get the real doppelganger, right? That's the evil twin, that's the clone. So you almost can't tell apart who is who, which one is real, and it's basically running at you trying to steal your life. Okay? So fakes are used as simpler implementation of a system. So for instance, in memory database. So instead of the real dependency, which could be, for instance, a database, you plug something else which will be equivalent feature-wise, but you lose something else which is not uh, relevant for your test. So in-memory databases, in my opinion, are a good example here in that definition because I find that fakes that's very often related to storage. Because if you're having something which ends up on database and you have to write plenty of tests, just because of the runtime of your test with the database, I mean, that would be way too expensive and you want to cut on that and having it in memory would just go faster. Um, so that's very often linked to that, so storage, or to the system you're running on. So that's why on LibSolid, which we brought like years ago, there's a fake backend which allows you, if you're a user of LibSolid, to run your test on a virtual machine, right? LibSolid will pretend being on a machine with some particular devices. And that's how you can simulate, uh, simulate that. So if you're in pain, have having me to talk, so now we're having a last example with Frank, so enjoy it. Okay, so. Uh, sorry, okay, here goes a fake. Okay, so, uh, the nice thing is it's fresh new fake, it's just being done like last week or two weeks ago. Uh, so we will, it's not every all tests have been ported, so we will be able to compare this one with the, right, the, um, the other tests right underneath. Okay. So the, keep looking at the selection. The test is about reporting all tasks, so basically having them all. If you look at how we do that, we just have a task query entity, which is basically doing a find all to retrieve them all. And we have, we're going to have a look at the initialization, which is done through a fake, because in order to initialize a query first, we pass a lot of things. Before here it was mock, I don't know if you remember. And here now it's some faked entity with, like you can see, data is a fake and create storage is a, a fake as well. So let's go to the initialization part. Okay. So the whole point here is just to see that the code is way simpler than before. Uh, we just initialize the fake, create some data. Okay, here we create two top level collection, we create a task. Great. Well, just read the comment and you will understand. It's quite easier to, to read. There is no all this uh, framework, mockito, mocking stuff that you, which is way more verbose. So it's basically acting like the real code. The thing is, it's not like the real entity, but it's really well imitating it. Okay, so uh, if you compare with the, the, this initialization with the, white, the, the one right under it, which is more or less the same kind of idea, well, you can see that here you have way more initialization. When you in initialize the object in a really different manner, you still set the mock, which is really verbose as well. You set each function of the mock, so you, you, your code gets way more simpler. Counterpart of that is when you go into the Akona defect data, you can see it's full of, uh, of functions that need to be implemented to mimic the, the real, the real ob entity like Akona D storage you, you're faking which is complex.
Okay, so just to give you an idea about that, because we see that there's this small blob of code for the initialization with the fake and the big one with the mock, uh, I started to port more of the test to use or fake, because that's the most recent stuff we have. And very often that stuff, which was something like 40 to 60 line of codes to initialize all the mocks to be, so that they are consistent between themselves as well, uh, compressed in something like half a dozen or maybe 10 lines of code and done. So that's the main point of the fake. Uh, it will simplify your test code quite a lot. Um, and that's because also you're closer to actual production code, right? You just initialize a state in a fake, and then all the rest is just the same usual code you would, uh, you would have. Um, and often, then, the fake is way faster than the original, especially if they are storage. But that means, potentially, you have a lot of code to write and maintain because that means you have to create a fake with the uh, relevant features. And so you have to write the test code for your fake, and then you can use that in test, right? So that's potentially quite some uh, code for the fake Akonadi, the in-memory Akonadi that we, uh, that we have right now in Zenshin, that 2,600 line of code. Uh, of course, that's something you end up doing if the technology, the dependency you're using has no ready-made equ equivalent, which was the case for, uh, for something like Akonadi. But if you use a database, just swap, I don't know, uh, MySQL for something in memory and done, right? So in those cases, that's much less work. Okay, so we have seen several types of, um, of uh, test doubles. And now you might be wondering, okay, which one do we pick? Is there one we should pick in every case? Well, we've seen that no, there's no silver bullet because they all, uh, they all have pros and cons, um, and none of them are ideal. So instead, we will leave you with kind of a proposed uh, approach, um, and that's broad guideline that we are now using uh, when we have to deal with testable. And of course, that's a proposal, and your mileage uh, might vary. So. Our opinion is that, well, you should use dummies uh, whenever you can, okay? Um, that won't hurt. Just make sure you're not killing your code under test by adding exceptions everywhere, like verifying, okay, that's a new pointer, I have to deal with it. But if you feel that's natural for your class, I mean, or that's easy to actually deal with a new pointer or something, just go for it and then uh, use dummies. Um, so whenever you can, but in practice, they have a limited use, so the whenever you can won't be that often. So otherwise, if you can't go for a dummy, release at the stub that you should prefer in most cases, 90% of the cases. That's the most common testable uh, you should have in your, t uh, in your test code. Uh, at the end of the day, that's just small helper class that you will use throu throughout your test, right? So that's reusable code between your tests. So that's generally a good investment because that's cheap enough and then you get uh, quite an impact. Um, if really you want to spare one, then you can use a mocking tool to create a stub. As we've seen, you just do the uh, state creation and you don't do the checking at the end. That's basically using mock tool to make a stub. But then you have to be very careful because it becomes very easy to unwillingly move away from that's just a stub to you that becoming a mock, right? What matters here that's not the actual, um, actual tool, that uh, the intent of the code you're writing. As for mocks, you have to use them temporarily. So they're really great when you're guiding the design, uh, guiding the, de the early design phase of some uh, part of your code. Uh, that's what I call last year emergent design because you start working on one class which needs collaborators which don't exist yet, right? So you create the mock and as you make the mock more complete to be able to make your test, you're basically in the mock what you're writing at the beginning of the spec the specification of the next class you will have to implement, right? So that guides you in doing that before you have the actual class. Uh, so that's very nice for that. Uh, but beware of the verbosity and coupling to implementation you provide. So that's why you should do that so that you get to the point of that specification and then throw them away uh, when you can. Uh, then you just remove them and favor stubs uh, or real objects whenever possible. As for fakes, there clearly are an investment. Uh, so that's stuff to keep for the frontier of your system, your external dependencies, because they might get very expensive if you don't have a ready-made solution, as we've just discussed before. Um, you jump on them only when you are actually settled on those dependencies. If you change very often, then that's 
wasted, uh, wasted time. And that's most useful for integration tests or acceptance tests, which are full task, uh, full stack uh, testing, where you want to speed them up and simplify. And that's it for us. Thank you for your attention. And I'm not sure we have the time for questions. Thank you. Yeah. So, there is a question, but briefly, since I have your attention now, uh, we will have the group photo. So, one question, and then we go out towards lunch, following the balloons, and at some point we will be stopped and uh, wait for a second to smile and then have lunch. So, everybody, please, after the question, go out, follow the balloons, and take a pretty picture. So, one, one single question, and then we need to be on our way. The, the code showed for the fake, and uh, the apparently fake that I cast did not inherit from anything, so surely this doesn't work with virtual methods. Does this mean this works with templates instead? Um, yeah, that might not be clear when you see only the using side uh, mm -hmm. of the code, but Aconadi fake data has then two methods. Aconadi fake data, that's like having the naked data that you can manipulate and so on. So that just wrapper around ashes and stuff like that to set your data. Okay. So it doesn't really need to inherit from anything. But then it has two, uh, could you put back the code? Uh, it has two methods, one which is create storage and one which is create monitor. Okay, and that's the one where we return an object with the right interface where it's all virtual and everything, okay? And then in that one, the implementation talks to the data that you just set in the fake data. Here. Okay? So, um, grab them on the way to lunch, after lunch. Uh, I'm sure Fred and Kevin will be around. Thank you so much. Thank you. And for those that have the same kind of short-term memory as